All right, hello everybody and welcome to our next installment of the Physics Colloquium. Uh, so today we're uh, happy to have with, with us Alex Maloney, who is visiting us uh, from McGill, where he is now a professor. Um, so uh, Alex got his PhD uh, from Harvard in uh, 2003. Um, so his PhD is not actually old enough to drink yet. Um, after which uh, he was a uh, postdoc uh, at Slack and is uh, also at IAS in Princeton. Um, and then he's been in McGill since uh, 2007, where he has the fancy uh, William McDonald Chair in Physics. So we're very happy to have him. Wait, explain. Sir the Sir William McDonald, because this is Canada, and so they have that <laughs> uh, Chair in Physics. Yes. Um, and we're happy to have him present to us today. He'll be talking to us about quantum fields, quantum gravity, and uh, black holes, and some of their applications in different areas. Um, and I did also want to say that Alex has requested a peppermint patty as his reward for a colloquium. So he'll he'll have that afterwards, indeed. All right, Alex, go ahead and take it away. Can you hear me okay? Is this okay? So um, thanks, Cindy, for that great introduction. Uh, it's great to be here. You know, this is my first in-person colloquium in quite some time. So it's really great to be back in the swing of things. Uh, so as Cindy mentioned, uh, I'm going to be talking about um, quantum gravity, quantum field theory, black holes, and our emerging understanding of some really uh, important and fundamental problems in quantum gravity. Um, my focus today is really to try and give you a broad overview of the subject without diving into too many technical details or you know fancy calculations or anything like that. And so in that spirit, what I want to do today is really focus on uh, just giving you an introduction to some of the broad kinds of problems that we're interested in addressing in this field. So the two real pillars of modern physics are Einstein's theory of relativity and the theories of quantum mechanics. And of course, these two theories are fantastically successful at describing most of the world around us. So for example, general relativity, along with the standard model of particle physics, are you know, incredibly successful at describing almost all of the phenomena that we observe today. But one of the deepest and most challenging problems in theoretical physics is that these two theories seem to be incompatible with one another. And in order to understand why these theories are incompatible with one another, I think one of the best ways to see this is to think about the role of time in these two theories. So in quantum mechanics, as you learned in your quantum classes, uh, time evolution is described by the unitary evolution of some uh, Hamiltonian acting on some Hilbert space. So you have something like a Schrodinger equation that describes time evolution as some sort of unitary process. And the basic feature of quantum mechanics is that the number of degrees of freedom of a theory does not change in time. You know, Hilbert spaces evolve by unitary evolution, but the number of degrees of freedom does not change. And uh, we can package that statement by thinking about Quantum mechanics is a theory where information is neither created nor destroyed. In general relativity, however, our picture of time is quite different. Uh, the geometry of time, and in particular, the geometry of space-time is a dynamical variable that fluctuates. Okay. Space-time can warp and change, and space can be created, and likewise, space can be destroyed. And so, at least intuitively, that is apparently in tension with the role of time in quantum mechanics. And I think this problem becomes sharpest if we think about it in the context of cosmology. So for example, as we know, our universe is expanding. It's apparently expanding exponentially. And so at first sight, this might mean that you would think that the number of degrees of freedom that describes our universe is increasing in time. But of course, that's in contradiction with the notion of unitarity in quantum mechanics, which says that the number of degrees of freedom can't change in time. And indeed, that puzzle is the sharpest if you think about the Big Bang, okay, right? If Big Bang was a moment in time when the universe began, then that's an incredibly strong contradiction with at least our naive notions of unitarity 
where the number of degrees of freedom describing our universe is constant in time, can't change in time. And so that leads us to question whether even the basic ideas of quantum mechanics, you know, the idea that states live in Hilbert space and that time evolution is described by some a Hamiltonian acting in a Herme as a Hermitian operator on that Hilbert space. The question is whether even these basic notions apply in uh, gravitational setups, in theories of quantum gravity. And in order to answer these questions, you know, we might want to try and answer these questions by addressing questions about cosmology, and that's something that we could talk about. But instead, it turns out that a very similar set of questions appear in black hole physics. And this really goes back to an observation of Hawking, uh, you know, some 50 years ago, which is that black holes, when we consider them as fully quantum mechanical systems, appear to destroy information and so appear to violate the laws of quantum mechanics. And in the last uh, few years, really in the last couple of decades, our understanding of these problems has really improved. And we can now give what I think is a consensus definitive answer to this question, do the laws of quantum mechanics really apply in theories of gravity? And the answer to this question appears to be yes. And so what I'll describe today, at least in part, is one of the techniques that we've used to really answer these questions in a completely precise uh, and definitive way, which goes under the name of holography or the ADS-CFD correspondence. And the basic idea is that although uh, in theories of quantum gravity, uh, the laws of quantum mechanics continue to hold, black holes do not destroy information, they nevertheless can appear to in certain ways. Okay? And so uh, this, this resolves this paradox. And in doing so, we'll learn all sorts of things about quantum gravity, things about the nature of black holes as information proce processors, uh, the deep relations between space-time and notions in quantum information theory and entanglement, um, as well as universal aspects of strongly coupled dynamics. Okay. So that's a general overview of the type of questions that I'll be thinking about today and trying to answer. Uh, the plan for the rest of my talk, well, first I'd like to talk a little bit about the relationship between black holes and uh, this holographic correspondence, this ADS-CFT correspondence. I'll talk about how our notions of quantum information theory and entanglement can be used to understand this in more detail. And I'll describe the sense in which entanglement is space-time. And then I'll move on to think about some more sophisticated topics. You know, I'll talk a little bit about wormholes, quantum chaos, uh, the structure of quantum field theories and things like that. Um, my goal here really is not to try and dive into any technical details. Um, and so at any point in my talk, I very much encourage any of you to raise your hand, interrupt me, ask a question. If anything I say is unclear, or if it could use any elaboration. And um, although I'm going to be giving what I hope is at least somewhat of a broad overview of the subject, I'll also be talking about some of my own work as we go along. And so therefore I shouldn't leave out my collaborators. You know, I've, I've listed them here. Uh, the green ones are the people that you can completely ignore. Um, the, uh, Blue ones are the people who are postdocs I was working with, so you can partly ignore them. Uh, the red ones were graduate students who were working with me, so they're, of course, the most important ones, and you should not ignore them uh, whatsoever. Okay, good. Um, and I'll try to give references as I go along, but I might miss a few, for which I apologize. Okay, good. And again, please feel free to interrupt me if there are any questions or any things that you'd like to be elaborated on. So let's start by remembering what a black hole is. So a black hole is an object that is so dense that nothing, not even light, can escape from its gravitational pull. So a black hole, therefore, is an object that is completely black, at least in classical physics. But Hawking's observation was that once the effects of quantum mechanics are included, black holes, in fact, are not black. They will emit radiation. And at least very schematically, we can think of that process of Hawking radiation as follows. So let's imagine that we have a black hole here. So that's a black hole. 
This black circle here is its event horizon. This is the singularity at the core of a black hole. And one way of thinking about the process of Hawking radiation is that in the presence of a black hole, indeed, in any uh, system, once you have quantum mechanics, there's some probability to produce a particle-antiparticle pair, perhaps an electron-positron pair, in the vicinity of the event horizon. And with some probability, you could create an electron-positron pair where one of the particles will zoom off to infinity and the other will fall into the center of the black hole. And so what that means is that there's some quantum mechanical probability for this black hole to emit radiation. Okay? And what Hawking showed is that this process does occur. And this Hawking radiation is emitted with a characteristic temperature that I've written here, which depends on the speed of light, h bar, Newton's constant, and the mass of the black hole. And this is known as the Hawking temperature. And at least in Hawking's calculation, a black hole will emit a thermal bath of radiation, a black body bath of radiation at this characteristic temperature. And indeed, it was this observation that led him to speculate that perhaps black holes destroy information. Because for example, you could imagine taking a you know, volume Q of an encyclopedia, throwing it into a black hole, and then waiting for the black hole to go ahead and emit away all of the uh, energy contained in that encyclopedia in the form of Hawking radiation. And because the spectrum of the radiation emitted is a pure black body spectrum that contains no information, all of the information in that encyclopedia will then have been destroyed in this process. So that was Hawking's proposal. Now, we can take this idea one step further, this relationship between black holes and information, by remembering the first law of thermodynamics. So black holes, of course, have an energy because they have a mass, so E is equal to mc squared. And moreover, Hawking showed that they have a temperature. So by the first law of thermodynamics, dE is TDS, they therefore must have an entropy. So you could then just go ahead and plug in that formula for Hawking temperature and integrate this equation to determine the entropy of a black hole. And it turns out that the answer that you get takes a very surprising form. The entropy of a black hole is proportional to the area of the event horizon of the black hole. And it turns out to be the area evaluated in Planck units. So the area over L Planck squared, where L Planck is known as the Planck length, and it's the fundamental unit of length that you can construct out of Newton's constant h bar and the speed of light. And you can see here that this Planck length is a fantastically small number. And so that means that for any sort of black hole that you might see astrophysically, say one whose mass is a few times that of the sun, um, a common sort of astrophysical black hole, this entropy is uh, a fantastically large number. However, I should, I should emphasize that there's also a sense in, with this, in which this entropy is an absolutely tiny number. And the reason is that in any normal thermodynamic system that you're familiar with, the entropy of the system scales with the volume of the system. It's proportional to the volume of the system. It's extensive. But what we've seen here is that Hawking's calculation leads us to associate to a black hole an entropy that scales like the area of the system rather than the volume of the system. So what that means is that there should be some sense in which black holes contain far fewer degrees of freedom, have a far smaller entropy than you would naively expect. And indeed, this observation of Hawking that the entropy of a black hole is proportional to its area is the first hint that quantum gravity should be holographic. So what do I mean when I say that? Well, what is a hologram? A hologram is a, 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 a picture where all of the information in a three-dimensional geometry is encoded in a two-dimensional image. And you can see that's what's going on here. You have all of the information uh, encoded in some area. Okay? And so that's the sense in which you might think that quantum gravity is holographic. Okay? And so um, the deep uh, question 
that uh, these considerations then lead us to is, is where does this black hole entropy come from and why is it proportional to an area? Okay. Um, and again, uh, there haven't been any questions, but I do encourage anyone to stop and interrupt if there's anything that I say that you'd like me to elaborate on. Yes, please. So what is the size of the area? So it depends on the black hole that we're talking about. So for example, for a solar mass black hole, um, it's the order of a few kilometers squared, something like that. Yeah. So again, this would be a fantastically large number, you know, of order 10 to the 40 or 10 to the 80, something like that. Good. But of course, for a very small black hole, it could be much smaller. Yeah. For a black hole whose area is Planck size it would be an entropy of order one. And we'll encounter an example later on. You might get an entropy of order one. Yeah. But this would be a sort of highly quantum mechanical black hole rather than a black hole of the sort that we might see astrophysically, which is described by a, a effectively classical system. Good. Thank you. Okay. Yes, please. Um, for That's right. Yeah. Indeed. Indeed. I mean, indeed. I mean, I think that, uh, you know, the statement that, um, you know, not every entropy is extensive with volume. That's a property of certain systems with local interactions. And indeed, black holes very much do not appear to have that property. Okay. Good. Absolutely. Yeah. Is there an electric static law saying that there should be an equal number of particles and anti particles in which you don't need that variety? Yeah. So, so, so the amplitude to emit an electron um, is balanced out by an equal probability amplitude to emit a positron. And so, overall, you know, in this Hawking emission process, a black hole would not require a charge on average, okay? But there might be fluctuations where a black hole might for some time acquire some charge. And indeed, one could talk about charged black holes, black holes with spin, black holes with, you know, color charge and QCD and all that kind of stuff if we liked. Good. Uh, yes, please. I find this uh, process a little confusing because you have yeah. something that's yeah, the, the naive picture where one talks about Hawking radiation as a pair production process is, well, there are other experts here uh, on that way of thinking about Hawking radiation, but, you know, it's a subject, you know, this is a cartoon and there are many different ways of understanding Hawking radiation, yeah. But sorry, maybe that wasn't the question you were asking. Okay, well, feel free to interrupt and ask questions at any later point if you like. I mean, the, dis the description of Hawking radiation as a pair production process um, actually can be made quite precise. Um, we can talk about that. I think Malik, oh, Malik is not here, but, you know, he's one of the experts on that as well. Yeah. Oh, but I, I guess I'm kind of like relating, like, the, the question going on the area where the entity comes from. Um, I was kind of relating it a little bit to, like, the, like yeah, you said electrodynamics, so... Is it basically like a different type of it's very it's very similar to the Schwinger process. So if I turn on an electric field, then there is an amplitude for electron positron pair to be produced. And then because you have an electron a strong electric field, uh, the positron will zoom off in one direction, the electron in the other. And I'll have the effect, the net effect of reducing the total electric field. Um, this is called the Schwinger pair production process. It's perfectly legitimate to think of Hawking radiation as a gravitational analog of the Schwinger pair production process, although it's a little subtle, as we could talk about if you want. Good. Okay. So where might this entropy come from? Well, you know, entropy is an information theoretic concept. We're talking about quantum mechanics. So what's one way that we can get entropy in quantum mechanics? Well, one way is from entanglement entropy. Let me remind you a little bit about how that works. So uh, entanglement is probably the most essential single feature of quantum mechanics. That might be a mildly controversial statement, but I'm willing to stand behind it. So how should we think about that? 
So the simplest example might be if you consider uh, the EPR state. So what is the EPR state? The EPR state is uh, a state in the Hilbert space of a quantum system where you have two spins. I call them a green spin and a red spin here. And here I have this entangled state, you know, a linear combination of two states where the spins are correlated in those two states. And um, the full system is in a pure state, by which I mean we have some exact quantum state. But if I were only interested in asking questions about the red spin and not about the green spin, then effectively, from my point of view, the system would look like it's in a mixed state. Okay, what do I mean by that? What I mean is that if you were to only measure, say, the red spin and not the green spin, then with a 50% probability, you would measure it to have spin up and 50% probability spin down. So what does that mean? That means that the density matrix that I would get by ignoring the green spin. So I would take the EPR state, I trace out the green spin. You get a density matrix with 50% probability to be up, 50% down. So then you that density matrix describes a probability distribution with an entropy. That entropy is log two, reflecting the fact that there's a single bit of information that has been lost by ignoring the green spin and only focusing on the red spin. So this is the simplest notion of an entanglement entropy. And the first question you might ask yourselves is whether black hole entropy is a kind of entanglement entropy, okay? Now, in order to try and answer that question precisely, we're gonna to need to think a little bit harder about black holes. And the first problem we have is that as we learned, black holes are unstable. They're gonna decay. So the next thing that I need to do is find a way of making black holes stable, okay? So how can I do that? Well, if you think about it, it actually turns out to be pretty easy. All I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take black holes and I'm gonna put them in a box. So I'm gonna study gravity, not in an infinite space, but instead in a finite space. It's gonna be a box of some size that I'm gonna call L here. And I'm gonna imagine that I have reflecting boundary conditions on the edge of the box. Okay. So what does that mean? That means that if you put a black hole in this box here, and it emitted some Hawking quanta, some particle via this Hawking radiation process, then eventually it's gonna hit the edge of the box and it's gonna bounce off and come back in, okay? And so what that means is that black holes can be stable once you put them in a box, okay? And in fact, I think you can convince yourself that the typical high energy state of gravity in a box is going to be a black hole. Why is that? Well, let's imagine that you have some box of finite size and you start dumping in energy, okay? Eventually that energy is gonna collapse into a black hole because that's what energy does for a living, right? That's general relativity. It says that if you take enough energy, enough matter, and you confine it into a finite region of space, eventually if you keep dumping matter in, it's gonna collapse into a black hole. So when you study gravity in a box, a typical high energy state is gonna be a black hole but it's gonna be a stable black hole because this black hole is gonna be in equilibrium with its own Hawking radiation. So this is how we can get a theory where black holes can be stable rather than unstable. And the typical dimensionless quantity that we would be interested in, which sets the uh, energies above which uh, you're going to have stable black holes is the size of this box as measured in Planck units. Now, C is not the speed of light, thank you. I've called it C because when I make comparisons with conformal field theories later, C is a name for a quantity that we refer to in conformal field theory land. It's referred to as the central charge, where C either stands for central or charge, I'm not sure which. Good. Thank you, great. Uh, good. So, now, we're all gravity theorists here, right? So when we build this box, I wanna build it out of gravity, okay? So one way of building this box would be to put a gravitational potential around this black hole that keeps this radiation from getting off to infinity. Okay? But we're not just gravity people here, we're general relativists. And so we know that gravity is described by the curvature of space-time, okay? So we can describe this box by a curved geometry. 
And so the box that we're going to use to capture these black holes and study them is a box built out of geometry. And the geometry that we're going to use is a geometry called anti-de Sitter space. Now, you know, if I wanted to, I could describe this geometry for you precisely. I could write down a metric. We could write down a coordinate system. I could do all of that stuff. But fortunately, I don't have to because it's very easy to draw pictures of anti-de Sitter space that capture all of the physics that we're going to need to think about. Okay. So in fact, here I've uh, drawn, or I've included, or I should say I've stolen uh, a very famous print by uh, M.C. Escher, uh, uh, my favorite uh, MC, who um, drew a picture of a Euclidean, of a version of anti-de Sitter space known as hyperbolic space. Okay? And everything you need to know about the geometry of anti-de Sitter space is contained in this picture. And all you need to know about the geometry of anti-de Sitter space is that what Escher has done here is he's taken anti-de Sitter space, which he's drawn here as a disk, and he's tessellated it with fish. And each one of the fish in this picture has the same volume, okay? That's the rule, or it has the same area, we should maybe say. That's the rule to understand the geometry of anti de Sitter space. Unlike the geometry of flat space, where you would draw each fish as having the same size, the geometry of anti de Sitter space is captured by the rule that each one of these fishes that we've drawn here has exactly the same size. And you can see that the curvature of anti de Sitter space is captured by the fact that you have all these infinite sea of fish that are accumulating out at the boundary of anti de Sitter space, which is the circle. Now, if you look at this picture, you'll notice, in fact, that there's a curious symmetry in the structure of these fish. Okay, that's why Escher loved drawing pictures of hyperbolic space, of anti de Sitter space, because of this curious symmetry. And that symmetry is that if you take, let's take some of these fish and let's track them as they go out towards the boundary. Then what you'll notice is that these fish, they rescale by a constant factor every time you go out to the boundary. Okay, this fish, it rescales in size by a factor of two in that step and a factor of two in that step and a factor of two in the next step. And there's an infinite number of such steps and they only take up a finite amount of distance until you get out to that boundary circle. Okay. So that's a symmetry that we refer to as a scaling symmetry or a conformal symmetry of this geometry. And it is that geometric symmetry of the anti de Sitter geometry that we use to capture these black holes that leads to what uh, I'm going to call the ADS CFT or holographic correspondence. So what is this correspondence? The idea is that a theory of gravity in this box in anti de Sitter space is equivalent to what we call a conformal field theory that lives on the boundary of this box. So with regards to this picture, we have a theory of gravity that lives in the interior of this disk. This is my gravity in a box. And we have a conformal theory that lives on the boundary. And what is a conformal field theory? Well, conformal field theories are actually very simple to understand. Okay. So the word conformal means that it is scale invariant. And the word field theory means that it's a theory with local degrees of freedom, degrees of freedom at each point in space time. So in fact, you all know examples of conformal field theories. The simplest example of a conformal field theory is classical electromagnetism, right? Electromagnetism is a theory of photons, but uh, photons have no Compton wavelength, right? Their Compton wavelength is infinity. So that means that in classical electrodynamics, there is no dimensionful scale, right? Classical electromagnetism is scale invariant. And of course, it's a field theory because the electric and magnetic fields are functions of where you are in space time, right? The word field is right there in the name of electromagnetic, electric and magnetic fields. So classical electromagnetism is an example of a conformal field theory. But in fact, conformal field theories are completely ubiquitous in physics. They show up everywhere. And uh, another, so for example, 
Uh, they show up when you're studying phase transitions. They show up when you're studying particle physics. They show up, you know, literally everywhere. Another famous example of a conformal field theory that you might be familiar with is when we study uh, statistical mechanics systems at their critical points. So for example, you can consider the famous Ising model. What is the Ising model? It's a model of interacting spins. Uh, the spins in the Ising model will interact with some typical correlation length okay, that I've called C here. But if you go to a critical point, you go to the critical temperature of the Ising model, then that correlation length goes off to infinity. What does that mean? That means the theory no longer has a dimensionful scale. So it's suddenly become a conformal theory, a scale invariant theory. Okay. So this would be an example of a conformal theory, in this case, a two-dimensional conformal theory that arises at the critical point of some interacting system. Okay. And indeed, there's some sense in which these conformal field theories are really the building blocks of every quantum field theory. You can think of all of the field theories that we use in particle physics and condensed matter physics, and even in cosmology, as being built out of these conformal field theories. And our conclusion by thinking about this uh, relationship between the symmetries of anti de Sitter space and these conformal symmetries is that every theory of gravity in ADS is a conformal field theory, is equivalent to a conformal field theory that lives on the boundary of anti de Sitter space. Okay. Yes, please. If a uh, classical electromagnetism is, uh, is conformal, then uh, is quantum. Okay. I very, yeah, you, you noticed that I very was very clear, careful to use the word classical every time I said that. And the reason is that uh, quantum electrodynamics will uh, develop a scale due to quantum effects. Uh, so the answer is not quite. Okay. Good. I mean, it, yeah, it has to be defined with a cutoff scale, uh, quantum mechanically. Um, that would take us deep into the weeds of, weeds of quantum field theories. So let me punt on that question, but we can come back to it afterwards if you're interested. Good. Okay. So this has all been very general, but it turns out that this relationship between theories of gravity and ADS and conformal field theories can be made very, very explicit. And so I've listed here some of my favorite examples of this relationship between gravity in anti de Sitter space and some conformal field theories. Okay. So what I've done here is I've given on the left-hand side a list of a bunch of theories of gravity. Uh, some of these are very simple theories of gravity. You know, up here, this is just general relativity in a universe with two space and one time dimension. So an even simpler theory of gravity than the one that you would learn about in a GR class. And some of these down here are very fancy theories of gravity, things like type two string theory compactified on S5 with some number of units of Ramon flux or something like that. And then on the other side here, I've listed a set of conformal field theories. So for example, this here, this is the two dimensional Ising model CFT, the one that describes the critical point of that interacting spin system that I showed you on the previous slide. And up here, we have other sorts of relatively simple conformal theories that would describe other statistical mechanics systems. You know, the POTS model is one where you have uh, spins of a slightly different flavor interacting with one another and so forth. But then down here, we have some very fancy field theories. So for example, this here is a Yang-Mills theory. What are Yang-Mills theories? Yang-Mills theories are the theories of the fundamental forces, the strong and weak nuclear forces, for example. And what I have here is just a simple, highly symmetric version of such a Yang-Mills theory that's dual to this very fancy theory of gravity. Please. Good. Good. So I was, exactly. So in the middle column here, what I've done is I've listed that number that is the size of the box in Planck units. And it's the size of the box in Planck units so that I can give you a dimensionless quantity. Okay. Yes, Good. Uh, that means box. Indeed, indeed. <laughs> yeah. Good. So great. That's a very good. That's, that's a great point. We're going to get back to that. So, for example, these simple examples here. I told you that this was a simple theory of gravity, but of course, you really shouldn't trust me because it's a simple theory of gravity, but it's not a classical theory of gravity. 
And the reason it's not a classical or even semi-classical theory of gravity is that it's a theory of gravity in a box whose size is of order the Planck length. Okay, so if you like, it's a highly quantum mechanical theory of gravity. Okay, so then you can come back and ask me, well, how do you study that highly quantum mechanical theory of gravity? And I'll say, I'll tell you later, okay, um, because it's a little bit complicated. But um, indeed, so in this middle column, we, I've given you that dimensionless coupling constant, L over L Planck, that's telling you whether it's a strongly coupled theory of gravity or a weakly coupled theory of gravity. So... This number 24, for example, we'll get back to that example in a bit, that's going to be a theory of gravity that's actually relatively weakly coupled because the size of the box is 24 times the Planck length. Okay, so that means that I will be able to write down perturbative descriptions of that theory that are gonna be pretty good. And then down here at the end, we have a tunable parameter N, which I can make as large as I like. So I can take a semi-classical limit there. Um, so you should think of this parameter C here as, as being uh, one over H bar. In fact, it's not just like one over H bar. It's, if I restored my factors of speed of light and H bar, it would literally be one over H bar. Okay. Great. Good question. Good. Yes. Where does 4D GR land on this? Um, the 4D GR lands is a conjecture that I'll make on the last slide of this talk. Okay. Um, classical ENM is not actually a, oh, classical ENM. That's a good question. Um, I could make some, I could say some words about that, but let's come back to that at the end. Okay, good. Great. Okay. QED uh, is a theory with the dimensionful scale, with the Compton wavelength of the electron, so it wouldn't live on this list. Um, there are variants of this list where you can try and study theories with dimensionful scales, which would be dual not to theories of gravity in ADS, but theories of gravity uh, in uh, more complicated geometries. Um, so, for example, you could have also asked about QCD. Um, and there's a whole uh, field of study uh, where one tries to um, use uh, this strategy to study uh, more complicated theories that have length scales like QCD. Um, with varying degrees of success. Okay. Um, good. Good questions. Great. Okay. Good. So let's try and ask then whether this picture now allows us to understand uh, black holes a little bit better. Okay. So I told you that the typical high energy state for gravity in a box should be a black hole. And I gave you a list of theories. You know, these are theories that I can study. These are regular quantum mechanical theories. They have a Hamiltonian, they have a Hilbert space. You can compute their spectrum, okay? It's a little more complicated than the hydrogen atom, but actually in many cases, not so much more complicated than the hydrogen atom. So you can just go ahead and compute their spectrum. And what do you find? Well, if you compute the number of states as a function of energy in the limit where the energy is large, you take its logarithm, then indeed you find that that answer is the area in Planck units. So indeed, uh, in this way of understanding quantum gravity via the ADS CFT correspondence, the states of the black hole are just literally the quantum states of these conformal field theories at very high energies. Okay? So the states of a black hole are perfectly standard normal states in the Hilbert space of a quantum mechanical system. You know, in the fight between gravity and quantum mechanics, at least in this case, gravity wins. Or sorry, quantum mechanics wins. <laughs> sorry about that. Yeah, good. Okay. And what about our question about whether black hole entropy is an entanglement entropy? And indeed, you can also understand this very clearly in this ADS-CFT setup. All you need to do is understand in a little bit more detail the structure of the space time of a black hole in anti de Sitter space. Okay. So previously, I drew you a picture of a black hole, which looked like this. So this is a picture of the constant time splice, that is to say, the spatial geometry of a black hole. We have the boundary of anti de Sitter space out here, and we have the black hole's event horizon here. So here I've drawn for you a slightly different picture of an ADS black hole. So this is a space-time diagram 
where time is going to run vertically. And there's a spatial direction that runs horizontally here. And because I can only draw a two-dimensional picture, I've suppressed a sphere's worth or a circle's worth of directions here. So there's a sphere or a circle, depending on what dimension we're in, that also goes along with every point on this picture. Okay. And so this is the space-time diagram of a black hole. And I'm going to use units where light rays travel on 45 degree lines. Okay, the speed of light is equal to one in these units. Okay. This is a picture of a black hole geometry. So the uh, boundary of anti de Sitter space is going to be represented by this red line here. Okay, so for example, at a given point in time, that would be given by a point here. And that's going to be a circle, right? Because I've suppressed a circle here. So this point here is going to be this circle at the boundary of ADS, or it's the circle if I have a black hole in the interior at the boundary of ADS. And then as you go into the interior of the geometry, in terms of that picture, that's going in this direction here. Okay. And so this is the circle out of the boundary of ADS. You go inside and you get to the black hole event horizon. And behind this event horizon, you have this geometry up here. This is the black hole singularity, okay? And these 45 degree lines, this is, these are the black hole event horizons, right? Why isn't it event horizon? Well, it's because if you're inside here, then, uh, you know, the speed, of, the speed of, you know, you can't go faster than the speed of light. So if you're in this region, you'll never be able to escape out to this red line out at infinity, okay? So this is the black hole event horizon. And if you were in here in ADS, you jumped behind the black hole event horizon, you would inevitably, just because you can't travel faster than the speed of light, hit the singularity up at the top of this diagram. But from my point of view, the most interesting thing to observe about this diagram is that there's a whole other asymptotic ADS region out here that I've depicted by this green line, okay? If you've studied the Schwarzschild solution in general relativity, you're actually already familiar with this fact. The same thing happens for Schwarzschild black holes. I've just drawn it in anti sitter space. Okay. So what does that mean? Well, let's look at the geometry of this constant time slice here. Well, you have an ADS boundary out here, which is a circle that shrinks down to some size here. Okay, what is that size? It's the area of the event horizon. And then it blows up again as you go out to this other boundary here. So what does that mean? That means that when you study the geometry of a black hole in anti de Sitter space, it in fact has a wormhole, okay? It's a wormhole that connects two boundaries, a red boundary and a green boundary, okay? And so then what is the quantum state of this black hole? Well, the fact that I've used red and green should remind you of our discussion of entanglement entropies and the EPR pair earlier, which is that this quantum state, it turns out to be essentially an entangled state, just like the EPR pair that describes the entanglement between two spins. Except instead of two spins that are being entangled, it's now two conformal field theories, okay? Two infinite quantum systems, these conformal field theories that are entangled. And it's this entangled state that describes the black hole geometry, okay? And in fact, it's relatively easy to write down that entangled state exactly. I've written it down for you here. So here, instead of just having a spin up and a spin down state that I add together and to get you some entangled state, I now have this more complicated infinite superposition. The experts, this is known as the thermal field double state. And then uh, this is an entangled state. And so it has an entanglement entropy. How would we compute that entanglement entropy? Well, we would imagine that we only have access to one of the conformal field theories, say the red conformal field theory. You ignore the green one, so you trace over it, and you get a thermal density matrix. And uh, what is the entanglement entropy? Well, it's the thermodynamic entropy at uh, this temperature inverse beta. And that equals the black hole entropy, A over four in Planck units, okay? So what have we learned from this? 
we've learned that in this ADS CFT correspondence, you can think of black hole entropy as an entanglement entropy. Okay. It's not just two spins that are entangled, but uh, two different conformal field theories, two different very you know, big quantum systems that are entangled that give us this black hole geometry. And the, uh, you know, for the single EPR pair, we only had a single bit of entanglement entropy. But now we have this very large entanglement entropy describing a huge amount of entanglement between these three systems. Okay. So the moral of the story is that we had two quantum systems, okay? a red CFT and a green CFT, and we entangled them together and that built a wormhole. So what this means is that there's some sense, a very precise sense in this case, in which uh, entanglement is indistinguishable from space-time connectivity. Okay. To make this a little sharper, we could imagine going the other direction. Okay. You could imagine starting with a collection of green spins or green CFT and red spins or red CFT. And then you could entangle them very, very carefully to build that state that I showed you on the previous slide. And the result would be indistinguishable from a black hole. From the point of view, for example, of any observer looking, just studying the red spins, it would look exactly like a black hole. So this is a sense in which space-time is entanglement. Space-time connectivity can be completely mimicked by quantum entanglement between two different systems. You could even take this to be to its logical extreme and interpret a single Bell pair, a single EPR pair as a, a kind of wormhole, okay? But it would be a very small wormhole, right? Because you'd have to set A over four L Planck squared equal to log two. So the cross-sectional area of that wormhole would be absolutely tiny, 10 to the minus 35 meters or something like that. Good. So um, that's one way of thinking about black holes in terms of an entanglement entropy. But it turns out that we can actually do much better. Okay. How am I doing on time, by the way? What is the time scale? I'm getting close. Okay, good. That was a that was a satisfyingly vague answer. So I'll keep going. Okay. So we can actually do much, much better than just that very coarse picture. I gave you on the last slide. So for example, in this list of uh, examples of the ADS CFT correspondence, there are many examples that are what we would call integrable theories. And an integrable theory is another word for a theory that we can solve exactly, okay? like the hydrogen atom, for example, is an integrable Hamiltonian. Many of these examples, so these examples are also examples of integrable Hamiltonians. These ones are not integrable except in certain limits, okay? But let's try and study them. So let's consider that example that I was the fourth one on my list, okay? So this is an example of this ADS CFT correspondence at work. So this is an, an example of a conformal field theory. So a conformal field theory is just a normal quantum mechanical system with a, you know, a Hamiltonian and a Hilbert space, which you can diagonalize in order to compute the spectrum of the theory. So let me tell you what the spectrum of that particular theory looks like. Well, it has one state with energy zero, okay? That's fine, we have a name for that state. You call that the ground state, right? In the gravitational language, you would call it empty anti disitter space. Turns out to have no states with energy one, but it has one state with energy two, which we interpret as a graviton in the theory, okay? It's a single graviton bouncing back and forth between these ADS boundaries with reflecting boundary conditions. And do you use this ratio with Precisely, precisely. Um, sorry, E is the energy of the system. C was the ratio of L over LP, which in this case, you have E much greater. Yeah. So it, it somehow in this dimension. Yeah, E is the energy of the state measured in ADS units. Okay, so I, I was a little sloppy with my units. E is the energy measured in ADS units. And it turns out that the precise relationship is that E must be bigger than, than, so C is the thing that I called L over L Planck. 
happens to be equal to 24 in this theory, okay? Um, and a state is interpreted as a black hole if E is bigger than C over 24, okay? Um, so E equals one is kind of the boundary between when you would interpret something as- uh, so how do you break it from time to four? We're not just saying we should Yeah, Very okay. E should be big, so C was 24. So the, the C is 24 and E should be bigger than C over 24. So E should be bigger than one to think about something as a black hole. Is that, sorry if I've been a little fast. I've been suppressing a lot of like yeah. details. This is a theory of gravity in two space and one time dimensions rather than three space and one time dimensions. So some of the intuition that you have about general relativity isn't quite gonna apply. Um, in the, Cindy is flexible about time, but not infinitely flexible. So out of respect for that, I won't go into too much more detail and just summarize a few salient features. So, okay, so you've got empty ADS. We found a graviton here, but it turns out there's 196,883 other states with equals two. We interpret them as black holes. There are 21,493,759 states with e equals three. These are slightly heavier black holes and so on and so forth. Okay. And indeed, you can take a calculator, okay? And you can check that the log of 169,883 is pretty darn close to four pi, okay? What is four pi? Four pi is what you get if you take the area of the event horizon of this black hole and you divide it by four times the Planck length. Okay. So the, the formula, the Bekenstein-Hawking formula for the entropy of the black hole tells us that the uh, entropy of a black hole with energy two in these units should be equal to four pi. And indeed 196,883 is equal to pretty much e to the four pi. Okay. But now Hawking only knew about classical gravity and we're not studying a theory of just classical gravity because that quantity I called C was 24. Classical gravity, remember C was one over H bar. So C would be infinity in classical gravity. 24 is big, but it's not infinity. So that means that if you wanna understand these black holes, you need to start talking about quantum corrections. Now, the first, so how do we, we know how to do quantum corrections though, because we all took quantum field theory, right? So you just treat this theory, you know, you took quantum mechanics, you took quantum field theory. So you just used perturbation theory, right? In the language of quantum field theory, we would call this a loop expansion in the language of Feynman diagrams. So for example, this is the classical black hole entropy that Hawking would have written down for us. Then we have what you would call a one loop correction, okay? Comes from Feynman diagrams with a single loop. That gives you a factor of one over square root of two. Then there's a two loop correction that comes from Feynman diagrams with two loops that gives you three over 32 pi. And then there's an infinite series of Feynman diagrams that you can write down that you can sum up. Even in quantum field theory, you can go beyond Feynman diagrams. You can include what are known as instant tunnel effects. These are non-perturbative effects um, that we usually think of as being related to tunneling. You can compute them all. You can write them down. And what you get is a series that resums into the integer 196883. Okay. So this is an example of, you know, a completely precise version of this ADS CFT correspondence, albeit in a somewhat exotic theory of gravity. Okay. Now, I'm just going to, I only have like, you know, minus five minutes left or something like that. So I'll just be very brief uh, and not use too many of those minus five minutes. Um, and talk about, you know, um, you know, a sort of more, you know, you know, what's going on, you know, some of the more exciting recent progress on understanding this ADS CFT correspondence. So um, I told you on the previous slide about the CFT dual of a very simple theory of gravity, one that was integrable where I could compute everything exactly. But of course, um, in the real world, in real life, most systems are not integrable and cannot be solved exactly. You know, integrable theories are ones that you can solve exactly. Most theories are the opposite of integrable. They're what we would call chaotic. And uh, it turns out that general relativity, at least semi-classically, should be dual to one of these chaotic theories, not to one of these integrable theories. 
And indeed, it turns out that we know how to describe this really very precisely in some cases. It turns out that general relativity is best thought of as not dual to a single conformal field theory, but to an ensemble average of many theories where the coupling constants are essentially random variables. For those of you who have studied condensed matter physics, this would be very familiar to you in the study of disordered systems. You know, this is, this, this is related to what we would call quench disorder in condensed matter physics. Uh, when we study a spin glass, for example, what is a spin glass? It's a system of interacting spins where the interactions are essentially random variables. The coupling constants of the theory are random variables. And indeed, uh, one of the things that I think we've only really understood over the last couple of years is that general relativity should be dual to a conformal field theory where the coupling constants are essentially random variables. And I won't have time to really describe this today, but this can be most easily seen by thinking about the role of wormholes in the theory. Okay, So we saw already that a black hole is a kind of wormhole. There are other sorts of wormholes um, that lead us to interpret semi-classical theories of gravity as theories with random coupling constants, okay? Uh, fortunately, I'm giving a talk tomorrow in the cosmology group meeting at noon, is that right? Okay, and so um, rather than trying to explain this in complete detail, I will instead just use this opportunity to advertise my talk tomorrow while I'll explain this in much more detail. But really, if you don't wanna to go to my talk, that's fine. Uh, I won't hold it against you much because um, uh, I'll just say that there are some theories of gravity where this picture of general relativity as dual to a disordered system can be made completely precise. So, you know, here's an example. This is based on a paper I wrote last year um, with Edward Witten and, and some follow-ups with these people. But this is an example of a conformal field theory uh, with random coupling constants. Okay, so this is a theory of interacting fermions with a four Fermi interaction whose coupling constant is a random variable. Okay, now four Fermi interactions are ubiquitous in, in physics. So for example, the BCS theory of con superconductivity is essentially a theory of electrons interacting with the type of four Fermi interaction. Uh, Fermi's theory of the weak nuclear interactions is, a four, is an effective theory that involves a four Fermi interaction. Uh, the SY, the Sachdev Kateyev model, the SYK model, is a model of uh, almost spin glasses that involves four Fermi couplings. So, this is a completely ubiquitous model of physics, except for the fact that I'm treating the four Fermi coupling as a random variable. And it turns out that when we treat the four Fermi couplings as a random variable for this family of conformal theories, you get exactly the answer that you get in a theory of gravity. And that's what I'm trying to capture by this equation. Okay. Um, you know, this equation is, is very exciting. One reason why it's exciting is I got LaTeX to include pictures in line with all of the other elements of this formula, which is very exciting. But it's also exciting because it represents the statement that a conformal field theory with random coupling constants takes the form of a sum over geometries which is exactly what you would expect from the path integral of a theory of quantum gravity. This is something that I'll talk a little bit more about tomorrow. Okay. And finally, we get to the last slide in my talk, uh, uh, which answers a question that was asked you know, an eternity ago at the beginning of this colloquium, what is the dual to um, general relativity? And here I have a conjecture to answer. So we've learned that theories of gravity are equivalent to conformal field theories. Um, the space of conformal field theories is very poorly understood, okay? Because these conformal field theories are strongly interacting systems. You know, they're not systems like quantum electrodynamics with a small coupling constant. In general, they're strongly interacting systems. And those are, that means they're systems that we generally don't know how to solve precisely. But the data that describes a conformal field theory is subject to very strong constraints. They're subject to the constraints of unitarity, they're subject to the constraints of symmetries, in this case of conformal invariance. And the basic fundamental problem in the problem of strongly coupled field theory is to solve those constraints. Okay. 
And so uh, the conjecture is that general relativity in anti de Sitter space is dual to a probability distribution on the space of solution of this problem. That is to say, it's a probability distribution on the space of all field theories. Okay. So, you know, here I talked about a special theory of gravity that was a probability distribution over the space of four Fermi theories. Okay. The conjecture is that general relativity is an average over every conformal field theory. And the claim, and the claim is something I'll talk about more tomorrow, is that we can prove this. At least we can prove this um, for certain kinds of conformal field theories, those in two dimensions, dual to relatively simple theories of gravity in three dimensions. And we can prove it not in full generality because that's too much to ask, but we can prove it for classical gravity. Okay. Essentially, the observation is that the constraints that uh, describe the constraints of unitarity on conformal field theories are essentially a rewritten version of Einstein's equations written in a very strange language. So that's all I'll have to say. So I'll just, in the minus 10 minutes left, I'll conclude very briefly. So holography provides a unique window onto, onto, onto fundamental physics. Uh, we've learned how to think about the emergence of semi-classical geometry through the entanglement of more elementary quantum systems. Uh, we've learned precise integrable models of black hole physics, as well as more complicated chaotic ones. Um, but nevertheless, uh, many questions remain. So we have some ambitious goals for the future, um, which you're welcome to ask me about, uh, but I think I'll end there. Thank you. <laughs>